Good day. My name is Laura van Niekerk from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and I'm going to talk to you today about estuarine lakes in South Africa. I'm going to be drawing on material that's been developed by myself, Susan Tolia, Janine Adams, Stephen Lambeth and Stephen Viet. I also, while I was putting this talk together, realised that I might have given this talk the wrong name and that it should rather have been called estuarine lake complexes and lake complexity, because this is ultimately what this discussion is about. Why are we worrying about the estuarine lakes? More than 80% of South Africa's estuaries are smaller, predominantly open systems. Less than 3% is estuarine lakes, but collectively they make up more than 60% of our estuarine area. More than 84% of our estuarine habitat is also in a very poor condition. That is because these systems are less resilient to change. The biophysical processes function over very long time scales and the systems have very weak resetting mechanisms. More about this a bit later. These systems are also vulnerable to the vectors of global change, including climate change, shifts in seasonal rainfall, intensification of drought cycles, increased occurrence of floods, as well as increasing temperatures and evaporation. I'm going to give you a broad overview of the physical properties of the lakes and on some of these I will be touching again in later slides. Most of these systems consist of one or more larger circular water bodies with constricted inlets to the ocean. There's generally small tidal amplitudes between 15 and 20 centimeters. These systems can either permanently or temporarily be open on annual to decadal scales to the sea. They generally have large surface area to volume ratios with relatively low mean annual runoff flowing into them. And the freshwater input to these systems can come from a single or multiple large rivers groundwater or a multitude of small streams feeding into the various basins or a combination of the above. These systems thus have very low flushing rates with in situ processes like remineralization dominating. The maximum water levels in the Estra Lake is determined by the burn height, the mouth state and the fresh water input. Salinities are highly variable varying from fresh to hypersaline depending on the freshwater inflow, evaporation rates and the duration of the open state before the system closed. Mixing processes are dominated by wind and to a lesser degree by fluvial inputs. These systems are drowned river valleys filled by rework sediments. The sediment processes tend to be very stable with infilling occurring over very long time scales and sea systems resetting largely confined to flood events. Sediment processes are occurring at thousands of years versus for example a KZN history which within two or three years after a large event might be back to some sort of a sediment equilibrium state. Where are the lakes? We have 12 estuarine lake systems in South Africa, of which nine are still functioning relatively naturally, and three is highly modified. Those are Seagui Flay, Umschlatus Richards Bay, which is now port, and Schlepan, that I will not be discussing further. The systems that we will be talking about today is Verloren Flay, Botten Clay near Armanis, Jenningnes Atagallis, the Garden Root System, Stow Wilderness and Swartfly, St. Lucia, Umbobazelini and Cozy. Here is a picture of the lovely Fluorin Fly. To reiterate, the systems I'm going to be talking about today is Valurin Flay on the west coast, which is comprised of a long single basin system, 
Bot Plain Mont, near Horsten, which is a large system with the overflow through the Klein Mont. The Klein, again a single belly system. Yenning Nies, which has got a large estuarine section running into Sutendals Fly. The Tau Wilderness system around the Garden Route. It's got the Tau Estuary proper, the Serpentine Channel. And three main basins, Eiland Fly, Lung Fly and Ronde Fly, Swart Fly, St. Lucia Amphilose Complex with the larger St. Lucia system and then Amphilose coming in from the side. Hamburgo Basileni, which is a much smaller system with two little water bodies. And then Cozy, which is the furthest north on the east coast of South Africa connected through four basin systems. This looking at these systems just to give you an overview of some of the complexity of summarized the mouths of inlets of the systems and two of them jump out the Bot Kleinmund and the St. Lucia Amphilosi systems which each have more than one opening to the sea. A quick overview in terms of the parts that make up these systems, in terms of lakes or basins, we have four systems that jump out as being more complex. The Tau Wilderness, which has got those three basins coming up the length of the system. Smart Fly, which comprise one large one and then two shallower basin areas in their upper reaches. The St. Lucia Amphilosi system, which has got three main basins in St. Lucia. And then Cozy, which has got the jackpot, four basins, and a fifth one coming in from the side. In terms of freshwater inflows into the system, it makes up a combination of rivers and groundwater, with systems like Valurian Flay having one main river, but also being supported by groundwater. But Kleinmont. Two rivers flowing into the bot and one into Kleinmont. Klein is two, Yeningnes is two. Tow Wilderness has got the main Tow River, but two smaller rivers flowing into the Wilderness Lakes. Swartfly has got three rivers plus groundwater. St. Lucia Umphilosi. St. Lucia has got five rivers flowing into Umphilosi has got two, and groundwater plays a very important role here. The two most northern systems are both extremely groundwater dependent, with Cozy here being the most important because it's got three little rivers flowing into it as well. In terms of depth, again this is just giving you an overview, three systems stand out in terms of their depth, with Cozy being the deepest, with parts of Cozy being over 31 meters deep. The next deeper system is effectively Swartfly at 17 and then Tau Wilderness at 7. But the bulk of these systems are actually varying between 2 to 3 meters in depth. What is also of concern is that a large number of these systems are actually extremely shallow, with St. Lucia being the shallowest. And given its large size and its relative low inflow, one can expect that it would make it very vulnerable to fluctuations in climate and rainfall and runoff. This is the Klein Estuary near Armonis. Okay, now we get to the more complex part of this talk. And um, I need to explain to you how to read the figures that we've got in front of us. We've used a um, longitudinal scale drawing to illustrate what's happening along the length of the estuary. The sea is generally where the scale bar starts. The river is to the right of the drawing. Uh, we have drawn a circular picture showing which states generally follow which about the conditions. There's a color coding used here. Less than five fresh water is indicated in yellow. Brackish estuarine conditions, 20 to 5, is indicated in green. Turquoise colours is 20 to 25. Then marine water close to seawater is blue. 
and purple indicates hypersalinity. Drawings also indicate states with higher water levels and states with lower water levels. And the little circles on the side indicate whether we've noticed that this system is sensitive to drought events. So if we start off with fluid and flay, looking at all the literature, what we could see is that fluid and flay has got a limited open freshwater dominated state with very little tidal influence into it. And once the runoff is out of the system, within a few weeks, the system closes, then the water level is low. And then over time, with the next rainy season, the system fills up and the water level just rises in the system. But you can also see a salinity because of the weak connection to the sea very seldom change. And then there's a drought condition in the system in which under extreme drought conditions, it can actually evaporate to brackish conditions, but it's more like an alkaline brackish condition because of its concentrating um, mostly catchment salts. In order to reduce the complexity of the previous um, physical states we've noticed and to understand the cycles more, uh, we've tried to identify generic states that occur in the lakes. And so in the case of fluorine flow, we now have a closed state, brackish alkaline conditions that happens under drought conditions every 10 to 20 years. We have state two closed fresh with low water levels State 3, close fresh with high water levels. And then state 4, open fresh with limited tidal exchange. And like I indicated before, the estuary is only open for one to two months of the year. And this whole cycle takes two to three years to repeat itself. This estuary is very weakly connected to the sea because the water flows over a rocky soil. It's mostly close, mostly fresh and has at times shown to be nearly drying out. It's also similar to Umbuga Bizzolini, which I will not be taking you through today. So moving on, my next example is now increasing in complexity. I'm using the claim Eurader Monas. And this system is quite well connected to the marine environment. It breaches straight out into the ocean. It therefore, you could also see that it's got a much better salinity penetration into the system. I'll maybe start explaining the cycle here from the open state of the system. After a, a big rain event, the system would flush. The upper part of the system, this is the river rain section of the system, will be fresh. The main belly, which is a very deep system, six meters, will be brackish and only small salinity penetration would be occurring. Then moving on, as the system remains open, the marine water will penetrate further into the belly of the system. You will have your more brackish um, zone starting to develop here in the riverine section of the system. And as the summer flows reduce even further, we will have the most of the system basically being marine dominated. Only the riverine section will be about 15 to 25 parts per thousand. Then after some period, as the flows reduce even further and more sediment comes in, the estuary would close. It will close on this marine state, with low water levels, with the brackish water inside the riverine section. Then if flows increase, the system will become brackish right through, but will remain closed. And it may cycle depending on the inflow conditions between this closed marine and closed brackish conditions. During years of drought, the system will remain closed, but the water level will reduce even further. And hypersalinity conditions can actually develop here in the upper reaches of the delta section of the system. So taking that now, we've identified six abiotic conditions in the claim estuary, starting with the first one, a closed state marine with extreme low water levels, which is associated with the drought conditions, which occur about every 10 years or so now in the system. State two is still closed marine, very low water levels, very saline system. 
Stage 3, still closed, but we're starting to see some inflow into the system, so develop brackish conditions. Remember my color coding, blue for seawater, green for brackish, yellow for fresh. As it stays closed, the system goes brackish with higher water levels, and if more water comes into, the system becomes open and fresh. The claim, in general, stays open for three to four months at present. Then after some time, it remains open with a full gradient developing in the estuary, from fresh in the river section to saline at the mouth, and then finally state six, open marine, and um, with very little fresh water coming into the system, before it cycles back to the closed state. The reason why we have this salinity penetration to this level in the system is because, like I said, it's well connected, it's open at annual scales, and the salinity regime basically fluctuates between marine and fresh water. Okay, now we're increasing our complexity even further. This is the Bot Claymont system. Got two mouths, main basin area on the one side and little through flows channel to the Claymont. This system alternates between which mouth it goes to. We have problems in terms of the 20% less flows coming to the system and there's quite a bit of alien vegetation growth on the berm, which we believe has increased the actual berm levels around the system, leading to breaching at natural timescales, very unlikely. Also low line developments in this system's floodplain. Um, when breaching happens through the bot, it breaches directly to the sea, so it's got good salinity penetration. When breaching happens through the Claymont system, it's got weak connectivity to the sea and basically ends up in a fresher state. This system is mostly in a closed state, represented by these two conditions. In the one, it's closed brackish, which is what it is just after it's, it's closed. And then with inflow, it becomes close fresh with higher water levels. If it breaches through Claymont, the cycle just starts itself. If the breach, however, happens through the bot system, the system will become open to the sea, it will be open marine, it will become more saline, and depending on where the Claymont is open as well, which is possible, Claymont might also become more saline. Then, after about three to four months, the system closes. The bot itself generally, depending on when closure happens, often goes to a closed marine state with some hypersalinity developing in the upper reaches. Again, Claymont can either be fresh or a more saline brackish um, environment with large parts of the linking channel between them now becoming exposed. Under extreme drought events, the system can actually become hypersaline, large parts of the middle to upper reaches will become exposed, and like I said, the linking channel between the two systems will also become exposed. Claymont can be saline brackish or actually fresh. Then after time, water will enter the system again, it will fill up and go into the closed brackish state. So reducing our complexity, the system can either be well connected or very weakly connected, depending on whether it's through the bottom plane wound the breaching. It operates on one to four year cycles and its salinity ranges are from hypersaline to fresh. Our state is closed hypersaline in the drought condition. State 2, closed marine. State 3, closed brackish. State 4, closed fresh. Remember I said if it breaches through Claymont, it will actually cycle between these states on, a, on annual scales. And then finally, state 5, open marine, which will only last for three to four months. Okay, so now adding additional complexity, I'm going to be using the tow wilderness for my next level. The system has got a fully estuarine section that's tidal, connected to a lake 
complex here in this case it's got three like systems island fly long fly round fly there are three little bellies they're relatively deep systems three to four meters and um, then there's this link channel called the serpentine linking the whole system together i think i will start explaining what happens in these systems under the um, close fresh conditions just before a breaching uh, remember our color codes with yellows being more fresher conditions brackish being green and blue being marine orientated states so under higher inflow conditions when the system is closed the water level would go up if it goes up far enough it will overtop the berm and the mouth would open but at this stage most flows will just be running out um, they could be um, under the beginning of the open fresh condition as the water levels decline you'll have separation of the connectivity of the different systems when flows decline further we have an open gradient condition developing in the system with salinity in the tau estuary and in the serpentine definite disconnectivity between um, parts of the lake as time progresses further and flows decline even more the estuary would close you would first have closed brackish conditions under these low water level conditions we've got weak connectivity between the lake systems and it's slightly higher brackish conditions around about 12 um, and then as the water flows in further we've got the water level rising in the system the system is becoming fresher and connectivity increases between the different parts of the lake which is quite interesting what also should be noticed is that the system do get drought conditions um, during droughts the estuary proper might become quite saline the main lake systems remain brackish but as the water levels go down significantly there's more parts of the lake that actually become separated from each other so you have loss of connectivity of the three main lake systems depending on the water level and as I indicated before, the system is um, quite representative of what you see in the Yinning Ness and the Swat Flat as well. In the sense that it's got a main shrine section and then lakes attached to that. So looking at the toe, we've got a well-connected tidal section. The system operates through one to three year cycles and it mainly fluctuates from brackish to fresh. We've identified under drought conditions a state one close, very low water levels. Um, then as flows increase, it will have a close brackish low water level. As water flows increase more, we will have close fresh high water levels. Flows increase more, we've got state four open fresh, where it's connected to the sea. Then after the rain event subsides, we have state five open with a gradient and as flows decline even further we will go back into a close brackish low water state the open state only lasts for three to four months okay now we get to the biggest lake system in south africa the st lucia Mfilosi system i'm not doing this system justice here today I know Janine intends to talk more on St. Lucia Lake, so I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. And I've simplified a very complex process tremendously here. I'd first like you to ignore the drought states in St. Lucia and just look at the general cycle it goes through. We've identified at this stage, um, let's start with that general open marine state the system gets relatively low river inflow for its actual surface area so its lower reaches often develops marine conditions relatively easily then marine in the middle and some of the upper reaches more fresh if it remains open with low water levels into it it will develop an open marine to hypersalinity conditions 
as evaporation basically starts concentrating seawater in it. If it remains closed and gets inflow, it could have a closed gradient developing in the system with fresher conditions developing in the upper reaches while the lower reaches remain saline. And then following through, if it remains closed for long periods, and depending on how saline it was when it closed, the system can actually develop a completely fresh condition, which is more or less where it is at the moment. An additional complexity is that we've got the Amphalosi coming in on the side, which very much can also do its own thing, varying from brackish under the closed fresh conditions to a full salinity gradient to quite a marine in the bottom reaches. Um, again, I've oversimplified here because the Amphalosi can have independent states from this St. Lucia. Then what I also need to point out is that St. Lucia can have two different drought type conditions. The one is if it remains open, as it did during the dredging, but it's also possible under natural conditions. If it remains open for very long periods under low inflow, it can develop open hypersaline conditions and we are talking about salinities well above 100 where sea water is 35 or it can even develop close hypersaline conditions with extremely low water levels in the upper lake section. So the type of drought conditions St. Lucia develops very very much depends on the actual salinity regime of the system. Simplifying us our picture then for St. Lucia and Velozzi system is that the system is quite well connected through a tidal section and therefore gets quite a lot of salt water in it. It open and closes truly at decadal scales more than any other system. It fluctuates between hypersaline to fresh and it's shallow it, because of its shallowness it's extremely sensitive to droughts which can develop from a range of states. So we've got two drought states, open hypersaline, closed hypersaline. We have a closed gradient condition, closed fresh. We've got a state 5, open marine, and an open marine hypersaline, where hypersalinity starts developing under the normal closed phase. A final example and I must confess, I couldn't decide whether Cozy or St. Lucia was the most complex in states. It's Cozy with its four bellies. And um, I've got, again, a number of states here. Cozy itself is not that complex. Okay? Cozy basically fluctuates predominantly between two states. An open, fresh state with a full gradient in it. We, from basically the major lake... We have a fresh system going forward or an open marine fresh system which is um, under drier conditions you have much more salinity penetration in the lower estuary and into lake one and two. But then what we also see is cozy specifically is very sensitive to droughts maybe because it's groundwater fed but also because it's actually quite a large system. And under normal drought conditions, we will have the system going saline in the lower reaches and then brackish in the middle reaches and remain fresh in the upper reaches. So to summarize cozy, because it's quite well connected through the tidal section, lowest reaches. It operates generally on annual time scales in terms of um, open marine fresh and open gradient states. But it's also sensitive to our drought cycles and cyclones. And it fluctuates between marine to fresh water in condition. So the states we've identified for Cozy is state 1 under the extreme drought conditions, close, marine, brackish. So the mouth is closed and we could have salinities right up to lake 4. State 2, 
open, marine brackish, so mouth still open, but salt water is penetrating to lake 3 or 4. 3, open marine fresh, state 4, open with a gradient, and then finally, under extreme cyclonic rainfall events, we could have an open fresh condition developing in Cozy. Pulling all of the above together, we can now say that we have identified seven open conditions and five close about conditions that occur across all the estuarine lake systems in South Africa. And I'm not expecting you to memorize this, I merely wanted to show you the absolute complexity of conditions that is occurring in our estuarine lake systems. And every one of these states matters and drives complexity in our biological responses. Our problem is that humans tend to want to reduce this complexity. They don't like the extremes in water levels. They don't like the erratic mouth behavior. They don't like the extremes in salinity regimes or the way the systems can switch mouths. So the main thing is to try and preserve this absolute complexity of abiotic conditions in our estuarine lakes and therefore maintain the condition. This is a lovely picture of the Bot Claymont breaching. I would be a mess if I don't also talk a bit about the pressures on our estuarine lake systems. And here I've got all 12 of them back in the picture. This column represents the overall pressure with the red colours meaning high or very high levels of pressure and the yellow colours meaning low levels of pressure. And what you can see is only three systems have got relatively low pressures on them. So I'd fly in Babuzalini and Cozy. And pressures differ from reduced inflows, reduced floods, reduced groundwater input, stormwater and um, drainage channels in the floodplains bringing in nutrient into our systems, poor river water quality, we even have wastewater treatment works flowing into our estuarine lakes, Sequifly, Pot Claymont and this claim being three. We have reduced connectivity in that people have been fiddling with the channels between systems. We have artificial breaching in all but three of these systems or mouth manipulation. There is loss or degradation of riparian areas and wetlands. There's alien vegetation in most of them. A large number of the systems are subjected to grazing pressure. There's mangrove harvesting in four of our systems. Recreational activity like boating causes disturbance in a large number of systems, especially in terms of birds. There's extremely high fishing pressure on the lakes, with most of them having illegal gill netting on them. There's alien and translocated fish in them, and even two of the systems have mining pressure. So just in context of that, Global climate change pressures on the systems of freshwater resource development, pollution, the development in the estuary functional zone and artificial breaching thus being forced onto these systems, overfishing and biological invasions. This is further enhanced by the possibility of change in rainfall and runoff patterns. The very high likelihood of increased droughts and increased flooding events and then increased temperature and evaporation. So we need to understand the way these systems are being changed and how we can actually mitigate for some of these impacts to ensure future climate change resilience of these important systems. One of the key things we need to do is we need to monitor these systems and understand better what is happening in them. We need to understand the pressures on the Israel lakes. We also need to monitor some of the key physical parameters, runoff, mouse state and water levels, salinities and the biochemical parameters. And then especially bathymetry and sediment monitoring has been lacking in these systems. 
It's also important to look at key biotic responses, such as fish and birds. And then finally, also what's becoming very clear in these systems is understanding genetic processes and eDNA. There's some very good papers that's come out of late showing um, that the lakes are very special in terms of the role they play in genetic diversity in South Africa. In conclusion, the estuarine lakes are extremely complex and this complexity should be embraced as it supports our high levels of endemism and biodiversity. There is a continuum from very weakly connected to nearly permanently open to the sea. Every lake is unique. Don't apply the rules from one to the other. And although they are very large, they are also vulnerable to change, especially flow reduction, pollution, overfishing and artificial breaching. Um, Again, I would like to acknowledge that I've drawn quite a bit of material here from the development of climate change mitigation adaptation strategies for South African Lakes Project at the moment, being funded by the Water Research Commission, and which will probably be concluded next year. I thank you for your time. These are not part of the talk, but I just thought in case anybody wanted a quick recap, um, here is a bit more of a detailed summary of the generic abiotic states. Also remember that not only do we have these generic abiotic states, but they also cut across four biogeographical regions, giving you some sort of an idea of the absolute complexity that's involved in our lake dynamics. Thank you.